And now here's part two of my interview with Rachel Scalar, editor-at-large of Mediaite.com. Do you think that there's something there, that there might be some analogy between journalism and politics and women in both fields? Because if you sure. look at media and you look at the shows that have very high ratings, the highest ratings, like Bill O'Reilly, it, it's a lot of men. I mean, obviously, yes, there's Rachel Maddow, and that is terrific, but you still have a predominance of men. And then on the political side, it's the same thing. Women are 52% of this country, yet when they go into that voting booth, they're still, in general, not voting for a woman. I fought so hard to get people to agree with me that Hillary Clinton was being treated uh, in a sexist manner by the media last year during the election. And, and I had to fight so hard. So first of all, what I heard most often was, it's not against women, it's against this woman. We don't like Hillary Clinton. Why so, do you think that was so? Why was she so polarizing? I don't know. I, I come from Canada. I didn't have Clinton baggage. <laughs> To, frankly, Hillary Clinton, I sort of realized that one of the things that I liked about her, she reminded me of one of those got it under control moms from 80s sitcoms like Elise <laughs> Keaton. She had it all under control, like she had the family under control, she had her business under control, and like mom would take care of things at the end of the day. And I think that's a plus. I think the juggling factor of motherhood is a real plus. Not that I've experienced it, but I've experienced it from the, you know, the, the child end uh, as my mom juggled it. <laughs> Um, but yeah, Hillary, people did not like Hillary Clinton. They did not like her assertiveness. They certainly didn't like her, um, you know, if you were an Obama fan, you didn't like her. There was just like a lot of vitriol, and that's fine. Say, I don't agree with what you said during the debate. Say, I don't like your policies. But don't say, when I hear her voice, I cross my legs involuntarily, or <laughs> she reminds me of a first wife outside a probate court, or, so you the know, comments were sexist. Nutcracker. Yeah, there was a lot of that, and it took, it took Katie Couric, in April of 2008, coming out and saying it. And Katie Couric got a lot of backlash for it, but that triggered a whole lot of, is this coverage of Hillary Clinton sexist? And it finally became sort of an accepted thing that yes, you know, okay, maybe some of the stuff is a mite unacceptable. So do you think that part of that is because of the idea of a woman being ambitious? This idea that if you are a successful woman, whether you're in politics or some other field, and you are ambitious, that somehow ambition is a dirty word. I mean, there's just, you know, the, it, it, it's, it's how that ambition manifests. You know, the, the stereotype of ambitious women are typically cold, calculating, breakers of things. <laughs> I don't know exactly what I'm allowed to say. Um, well, bleep breakers, how's that? Um, and, uh, you know, I mean, it's, it's, women are more likely to be, like, attacked for that kind of, um, you know, real politic behavior in a boardroom more likely to be called worms, words that rhyme with which. Um, right. so, You're being very subtle there. Uh, I like yeah, it. No, I'm, you know, I'm just I'm conscious of our audience. I don't want to corrupt anyone. In case there are any kids um, watching. Yeah, exactly. But I mean, I think, you know, assertive behavior is generally a little bit harder to accept from women historically. Let's shift gears for a minute and talk about President Obama because he has been everywhere in the media. He's been on Jay Leno, he's been on David Letterman, he's talking at baseball stadiums, he's doing interviews everywhere. Do you think that he's overexposed at a time when we have two wars, when we have this national debate on health care and so many problems in this country? Well, I think that at the beginning there was the glow of Obamania, you know, and people liked it. He was getting really great feedback and it was making him human, it was making him accessible, people loved Michelle, um, they loved the girls and you know it was like no harm no foul um, and I think that the is Obama overexposed meme was just that, a meme, I, I mean I don't know if, if there have been studies comparing Bush and Obama, well, I mean, part of the reason that perhaps Obama's overexposed is he's taken a little bit less vacation time than his predecessor. <laughs> that might have something to do with it. So, you know, think back to the mission accomplished stunt. Like, I think that's a like a, that's an instructive thing to remember. That there has not been any huge grandstanding stunt like that, where you know Obama in a flight suit you know, with a huge banner and, and the, the band behind him. I mean, I think that there has been, especially lately, like there's been a definite air of humility. I mean, his speech at the, the Fort Hood at Fort Memorial was one of his best and really moving. And he gets it. You know, those are the times when you think he gets it. 
So it's really it's really hard to render judgment on a presidency when the first year hasn't even drawn to a close, and it's even harder to do it in sort of the Twitterfied, you know, instant reaction atmosphere that we have right now. Like, there's a market for considered thought and saying, okay, like he did this and he did this and he did this and this has been happening. This is my conclusion based on all of these things. Well, do you also think that because he had so much exposure and because his poll numbers were so high that it's almost like schadenfreude? At some point, you have to come down. At some point, when sure. you're built up so high, and we're certainly seeing that, I think, with Michelle Obama as her poll numbers start slipping, too. I think that they could have taken a lot more risks, put it that way. Michelle Obama has stayed way clear of the health care debate, and I, at the beginning, was sort of watching for that and thinking, like, she would have been a really good person to speak to what's actually happening to families. This is not a small thing. I've seen people quibble over the numbers, like someone said, you know, someone on cable said, like, 57 million people are not covered, and they were corrected, like, actually, I think it's more like 42 million. 42 million? <laughs> like, how, once you get to that many million people who don't have health care, the system is really broken, and something needs to be done. And, and I think, you know, kudos at least to the administration for trying to do it. They're, they're getting somewhere.